And if I don't, if I don't answer it sooner, people want to know why I wrote this book. Why of all the people that I could have written a biography of, I picked David Swain. And the truth is, I didn't pick him. I was asked by the University of North Carolina Library to do it. And it's part of a series they are doing. Some of you will remember the late Albert Coates, who was a law professor at Chapel Hill. But his claim to fame was that he founded the Institute of Government, now the School of Government. He and his wife Gladys kept it going with their own money during the Depression. And at their deaths, they left their estate, they had no children, to the North Carolina collection at the UNC Library to be used first for a biography of Albert and then for biographies of the presidents and chancellors of the university. David Swain was and almost certainly always will be the longest serving president of the university. He was the president from 1835 until 1868, almost 33 years. In today's world, nobody's gonna be president of a university that long. This is a picture of Swain, actually a picture of a portrait of him and the title of the book. Swain was the son of George Swain and Caroline Lane Lowry. This slide depicts his birthplace near Asheville, which is still standing and is a state historic site. <clears throat> George Swain had come to Asheville <clears throat> from Massachusetts with a stop in Georgia where he was a justice of the peace, member of the state legislature and delegate to a state constitutional convention. In the winter of 1795 and 96, prompted by health concerns and believing a mountain climate more suitable for his fragile constitution, he moved to Buncombe County in the mountains of North Carolina. He was a hatter by profession. His shop was near the current site of the Grove Park Inn in Asheville. He was also a farmer, deputy postmaster and postmaster in Asheville, and by the rather relaxed standards of that day, a physician. On December 2nd, 1788, he mar married Caroline Lane Lowry, the widow of Captain David Lowry, who had been killed fighting in an Indian raid. Caroline was from a prominent North Carolina family, said to have been connected with Governor Ralph Lane, who led an English colony to Roanoke Island in 1585. She was a sister to Joel Lane, whose land became the site of the city of Raleigh, and Jesse Lane, who was the father of Joseph Lane, a military general, governor of and US Senator from Oregon, and Democratic candidate for vice president on the John C. Breckinridge ticket in 1860. The couple had five daughters and two sons, David Lowry Swain was the youngest, and he was named <clears throat> for Caroline's first husband. Something that seems strange to us, but that was fairly common in those days when many people died quite young. <clears throat> we know very little about Swain's childhood. He was said to have been a good scholar at Newton Academy, there were no public schools at the time. Newton was an academy run by Presbyterian ministers in Asheville. And education there was considered adequate preparation 
for entry into the junior class at UNC. He chose to go there rather than to Columbia College, which later became the University of South Carolina, but he stayed only a short time before moving on to quote, read law under Chief Justice John Lewis Taylor of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Again, something rather foreign to us, but that was common in those days. It was thought that you didn't need an undergraduate degree to study law, that that was in some instances considered a waste of time. He should get on with preparing for his profession. Swain was a very serious student, but he served on the Raleigh Grand Jury when US Supreme Court Chief Justice uh, John Marshall convened the circuit court in Raleigh, and he spent time witnessing the Wake County courts in action generally. The legislative branch also called his attention. He observed its proceedings, supported bills pending in it, a nascent interest in politics, government, and all aspects of public life was clearly maturing in the youthful law student throughout this period. David left Raleigh with Judge Taylor's admonition to read law books daily. The judge gave him a list of books recommended for a small library. David was, Chief Justice Taylor told Swain's father, a dutiful and accomplished son who would gild the evening of his father's old age. As a lawyer, Swain returned to his hometown of Asheville to commence practice. It was the first time a native of the county had returned there as a lawyer. In those days, lawyers traveled the circuits, going where the courts were being held and they could find business. Like most lawyers of his day, his practice was general in nature, apparently predominantly civil, but at least occasionally he handled a criminal case. He maintained an asheville based legal career until his election as a Superior Court judge. The practice of law was never his major interest though. He had barely alighted in Asheville as a lawyer when he bought 100 acres of land to meet property qualifications and in 1824 returned to Raleigh as a 23-year-old member of the House of Commons. Brief mention of a Swain predecessor in the General Assembly, then structure to his service and provides context for its evaluation. Archibald DeBeau Murphy represented Orange County in the North Carolina Senate from 1812 to 1818. North Carolina was then so backward that it was known as the Rip Van Winkle State. Murphy was the leading rooster in Old Rip's barnyard rousing the state to serious consideration of a system of public education, internal improvements, and constitutional reform. Internal improvements, what we call infrastructure, were foremost in Swain's buy into the Murphy program. The prosperity and happiness of the state, he told his constituents, depends greatly upon the success of our system of internal improvements and sexual, sectional prejudices and narrow economy ought never to be suffered to influence our course. The Buncombe Turnpike Company, referred to in the notice for subscriptions in this slide, was Wayne's prime legislative accomplishment. His bill authorized the making of a turnpike road 
from the Saluda Gap in Buckham County to the Tennessee line. In the context of the time, it would revolutionize commerce and development in Western North Carolina. It opened the mountains to traffic from the Piedmont and to new levels of immigration and travel and trade from Tennessee, Kentucky, and South Carolina. Swain saw internal improvements as advancing economic development and economic development as prerequisite to universal public education. <clears throat> Although concrete accomplishments in the latter area eluded him, he was an able and articulate advocate for the cause moving the state slowly but surely in this direction. There was one brief interlude in Swain's five one-year terms in the House. The solicitor prosecuting attorney in the first judicial circuit in the northeastern corner of the state died. The district's leadership could not agree on a candidate Swain's legislative service and general participation in affairs of state had made him acceptable to a wide range of the state's leadership. He was elected, served in the position for approximately a year, and in so doing, quote, significantly increased his knowledge of the state and enlarged the boundaries of his intercourse with its citizens. After brief further legislative service, the General Assembly elected Swain a Superior Court judge, a position in which he would serve for approximately two years, again increasing his knowledge of the state and enlarging the boundaries of his intercourse with its citizens. In Swain's time, the General Assembly elected the governor. The governor was eligible for three one-year terms in succession. When the assembly met following the 1832 election, the governor, Montford Stokes, had served two terms and was eligible for a third. He declined re-election, however, because President Andrew Jackson had appointed him chair of the Federal Indian Commission. This had been unexpected, and the assembly met stalemate in attempting to fill the position. As with the Northeastern District solicitorship, it once again turned to the youthful statesman from the West. Swain's even temper, intellectual ability, well-regarded character and moderation aided the coalescence around his candidacy. <clears throat> as Governor Swain picked up where he had left off as a legislator, advocating for internal improvements, the bedrock of the Murphy vision for advancing the state. These included coastal inlet betterment, canals, highways, railroads, and swamp reclamation. Such improvements could lay the foundation of a school system as extensive as our limits and as enduring as our prosperity. Once Swain had articulated that vision, he commenced to implement it. His first year as governor brought two internal improvements conventions. You see here the cover of the report of one of them. <clears throat> he served as president of both. And when the state conventions were not in session, he pursued the cause locally. He attended local improvement meetings when he could and received reports on those he could not attend. 
Although Swain's commitment to public education could scarcely have been more zealous, no action was readily available when the state treasurer sent him the chilling statement, no children have as yet been educated at public expense. <clears throat> he correctly assessed the state's limited economic capacity, however, and continued to nudge the state toward the time when it could afford to educate its children. <clears throat> Among Swain's numerous <clears throat> miscellaneous duties as governor was the appointment of three commissioners to revise the state's statutory law. <clears throat> the revisal project continued over several years. <clears throat> the, three <coughs> the three men pictured here were the commissioners, William Horn Battle, Frederick Nash, <clears throat> later Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, and Governor James Iredell. The end product, the revised statutes of 1837, <coughs> constitutes a significant aspect of Swain's legacy for state improvement. <clears throat> Constitutional reform was an overarching issue in the Swain administration. The county basis of representation placed controlling power in the East, the older, more settled section with the largest number of counties. Property qualifications for office holding narrowed the ruling elite still further making Eastern landowners the dominant class and giving them control of the state. <clears throat> the West came to have most of the state's white population, but the state government continued to be administered largely for the benefit of the East. There was a significant disparity and it was only in the last of his three years in office that the youthful governor from the West managed to redress it. By very thin legislative margins and a close vote by the state's people, a state constitutional convention convened in Raleigh's first Presbyterian church, shown here on June 4th, 1835. Nathaniel Bacon, the state's longest serving member of the US Congress, now retired, was president of the convention and Swain was its chairman pro tem. While the convention passed on many matters, Swain identified the East-West breach over legislative representation as its great business. With Swain as their leader, and a handful of courageous Eastern representatives voting with the Westerners, the imbalance was significantly redressed. The amendments prevailed with a public by a margin of 5,165 votes. Swain's efforts arguably kept the state together and certainly enabled its various sections to function as a unit more harmoniously. The 1835 reforms that he championed also diminished the influence of the Eastern North Carolina slaveocracy. <clears throat> During Swain's last year as governor, Joseph Caldwell, the longtime president of the University of North Carolina died Five days before Swain left the governor's office, the University Board of Trustees elected him to succeed Caldwell. Chapel Hill was then a sleepy town in a sleepy state, 
though arguably at least, less so than before David Swain became governor. The new president was not a complete stranger to the quiet village. He had been there briefly as a student and almost four years as a trustee had brought him back. The little town's residents were naturally curious about their new leader. There was some disappointment when the youthful, off, awkward looking, physically unattractive president arrived. He would grow to hold his own with anyone, to make himself felt as a remarkable man, second to none in sagacity, prudence, and administrative ability. The villagers would always call him Governor Swain, and it was appropriate because the larger, larger life of North Carolina, and to no small degree, the United States continued to reflect his fingerprints. A modern academic setting includes admission deans and offices. In Swain's time at UNC, by contrast, he was the portal of entry and the process was casual and informal. Technically, the faculty admitted students. In reality, though, it was the president. Once students arrived in Chapel Hill, an in loco parentis philosophy prevailed. The university stood in place of the parents. And in this regard, to a significant degree, Swain was the university. Parents were entrusting their sons to him, and many chose the university as the place for their sons because he was there. In their student days, undoubtedly, there were those who chaffed under, even resented Swain's paternal ministrations. For the most part, however, they grew to appreciate them and to love him. As students, though, they did not always accept quiescently the in loco parentis role that Swain and the faculty assumed. Unruly boys took their revenge in cursing, drunkenness, pranks, unauthorized absences, and occasional violence. The consequence was that much of the time, Swain functioned like a modern dean of students, dealing extensively with disciplinary matters. These consumed a considerable portion of the man's time and energy for the last half of his life, and a lengthy chapter in the book details this. As he handled disciplinary matters, Swain was instructing. Most of his interactions with students were, to some degree, didactic in purpose. Throughout his UNC presidency, however, he was not just an administrator, but also a classroom teacher. His teaching load did not differ dramatically from that of other faculty members. Swain took the classroom instruction dimension of his duties seriously, so much so that he had students come to his house to obtain their reports as depicted in this picture. In Swain's view, the chief function of the university was to prepare political leaders for the state. The subject matter of and materials for his classes were well suited to this public service orientation. He taught the seniors national law, intellectual philosophy, and moral science. His teaching repertoire included religious and moral instruction. He spent an hour on Sunday afternoons teaching the Bible to seniors. A student once bragged that he had, quote, 
uniformly prepared the lessons well, motivated by Swain's inspirational teaching. In fulfilling his multifaceted role as president of the university, David Swain was, ever and above all else, a teacher. While he was disciplining and teaching, Swain was also gathering around him what has been described as probably as strong a faculty as was to be found in the Old South. By modern reckoning, it was quite small, fewer than a dozen plus some tutors. From the outset of his presidency, Swain acquired, enhanced and embraced power and influence with the small faculty. He usually consulted them before acting. He was the steady liaison between them and the trustees, particularly the board's executive committee. As with the students, Swain was the portal of entry for faculty applicants. Advocate, advocates for them and sword, implored Swain on their behalf. One instance of Swain employing a friend had felicitous and lasting benefits for Swain and the university. Formal university-based legal education was not then the norm. Prospective lawyers read law under an established lawyer or judge until they considered themselves prepared for the required examination. But Swain had a vision for formal legal education at the state's public university. When he noted that Judge William Horn Battle and former Governor James Ardell had started a private school in Raleigh to prepare aspirants for the bar exam, then administered by the state Supreme Court. Swain had his eye on it. He articulated a forward looking perspective on university based legal education. My plan would be to make the law school an integral part of the university. Swain stated with clear vision and to confer degrees as at Harvard. Judge Joseph Story of the US Supreme Court was a law professor at Harvard. So why, Swain asked his friend, should not Judge Battle become so here? <coughs> <coughs> Ultimately, <clears throat> This significant entry appears in the trustee executive committee minutes. Professor Swain, President Swain attended the meeting of the committee and presented a program embracing a law professorship with the Honorable William H. Battle as its head, which with some modifications was approved. With the employment of Battle as law professor, <laughs> and Charles Phillips as professor of math, the university entered a period of faculty stability. This interest ended in the summer of 1857 with the sudden tragic demise of Elisha Mitchell, shown here, longtime beloved and respected professor of chemistry mineralogy and geology. Mitchell died from a fall while exploring the North Carolina mountains to acquire new <laughs> scientific information. <laughs> Swain learned of Mitchell's fate from his former student Zeb Vance, later governor of North Carolina. Our dear old friend, Dr. Mitchell, Vance said, is no more. No one felt the loss more keenly than Swain, who had lost his right arm through thick and thin. The university hired Professor William J. Martin, a graduate of the University of Virginia, 
and proceeded with its educational program, but the loss of Mitchell was a profound one indeed. <clears throat> Benjamin Hedrick, shown to the left, my left, graduated from the university in 1851 with highest honors. Swain had conveyed to the faculty and to Hedrick, quote, his anxiety to see him devote his life to scientific pursuits. He did so with a view in due time to a situation as an instructor here. Hedrick earned a doctoral degree from the Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard University and indeed returned to Chapel Hill as professor of agricultural chemistry. He was popular with Swain, the faculty, and the students. Unfortunately, however, his political views deviated sharply from those of most white North Carolinians, including the political establishment. On the foremost issue of the time, slavery, there was then little tolerance for dissent. In the 1856 presidential election, Hedrick opined in response to a question from a student that the best candidate was the Free Soil Party's John C. Fremont. If there was a Free Soil ticket on the North Carolina ballot, he would vote for it, he said. The Free Soil Party opposed the expansion of slavery into the territories. This, to most North Carolinians, particularly to those whose opinions mattered most, was unpardonable heresy. With William W. Holden's North Carolina Standard newspaper fanning the flames of the controversy, a UNC faculty committee reported that Hedrick's conduct was, quote, not warranted by our usages, nor were his political opinions entertained by any other faculty member. The trustee executive committee dismissed him for, quote, misbehavior. He ultimately left the state never to return. The matter shocks our 21st century consciences. It was a flagrant denial of both First Amendment freedom of speech rights and academic freedom. But in the 1850s, neither concept had implanted itself in serious fashion into the legal lore or the public consciousness. As legal historian Alfred Brody has noted, tenure is a development of the 20th century. Faculty members in the antebellum period were routinely fired for political reasons. Swain gave serious and sustained attention to the university's annual commencements. His invitations could be rather imperious in tone. A young William A. Graham, who would later become governor of the state, was told by Swain that he, quote, must attend. Do not fail to attend our commencement, Swain once wrote to Calvin H. Wiley, his former superintendent, now superintendent of common schools. While all Swain era commencements were special, those of 1847, 1859, and 1867 were especially so. At each, the sitting president of the United States was in attendance. And the presidents are pictured here. At the first of these, the campus was a familiar place. James Knox Polk was and remains the only graduate of the university to occupy the office. A member of the class of 1818, Polk had graduated with first honors in mathematics and the classics. 
There was a degree of novelty in his 1847 visit, nevertheless, for he had not returned to the village in the ensuing 29 years. <clears throat> Polk's visit spurred considerable primping of the campus buildings. One suspects that a rather spiffy academic village greeted the country's chief magistrate then in the third year of his presidency. <clears throat> there were rumors that President James Buchanan would attend the 1858 commencement. He didn't, but promised to be president in 1859 and kept his promise. Buchanan's visit as chief magistrate, Swain said in greeting him upon his arrival, is a compliment of which may, we may well feel proud. Cognizant of the precarious state of the union over which he presided, the Civil War was only a few months away, Buchanan left the young man <clears throat> with this admonition, let this constitution be torn into atoms, let the union separate, let 30 Republicans republics rise up against each other, and it would be the most fatal day for the liberties of the human race that ever dawned upon any land. By all appearances, Buchanan enjoyed the occasion immensely. Certainly, Swain did. One account stated, were he translated to heaven now, he would be unhappy. He would find it flat. I am sure. The national breach that Buchanan feared, of course, came. In its wake, the university awarded the honorary degree Doctor of Laws to President Andrew Johnson in 1866, and the president attended the university's commencement the following year. He attended the dedication of a monument to his father in Raleigh, with Spain, Swain as the speaker, and attended the university's commencement later in the same week. The visit generated poignant memories for the president. He told of walking the street in front of Swain's house as a young man en route from his native Raleigh to his adult residence in Tennessee. His next visit to Chapel Hill was as the president of a republic of 40 million people. As UNC president, Swain kept himself aloof from state politics. He was, however, anything but indifferent to political matters on the sidelines to a relative degree, yes, oblivious to, dispassionate about, and detached from such matters, not at all. In his time as UNC president, railroads were the focus of Swain's internal improvements efforts. His presence at railroad meetings was avidly sought. Governor Moorhead once told him as a Greensboro Railroad Convention approached, you will be indispensable at our convention. The waters were troubled and Swain's presence was needed to do the strong work. He attended numerous railroad conventions and involved himself in internal improvements in many ways, advancing the internal improvements cause not just as an end in itself, but as the mean to, means to economic resources sufficient to achieve and sustain universal public education. Swain had a proclivity for the past and we are deeply indebted to him because of it. He did not consider himself a historian, but actually he was a good one. He read and studied it constantly and devoted much of his life to collecting and preserving its sources. 
first billing went to North Carolina history, but his interest ranged far into the field. Francis Lister Hawks was a close collaborator of Swain's in his North Carolina history endeavors. Hawks studied law, but left the legal field for the ministry, serving churches and seminaries, mostly in the North. From a Northern perch, Hawks worked on a history of North Carolina. A lengthy collaboration between, between him and Swain commenced early, one in which Hawks came to consider Swain essential to his endeavors. Samuel Ash's biographical history of North Carolina calls Hawks' history of the state invaluable and accurately states that it bears Swain's imprimatur. Hawks himself said that Swain rendered to him every assistance in his power and that everyone knew such assistance could not but be valuable indeed. John Hill Wheeler was another historian of North Carolina with whom Swain worked episodically. Wheeler collected original documents related to North Carolina history in collaboration with Swain and historians George Bancroft and Peter Force. His historical sketches of North Carolina published in 1851 was dedicated to the three of them. The dedication said of Swain that his native worth, services, and talents alike are the state's pride and ornament. Swain had a long-standing relationship with George Bancroft, prominent national historian, government official, and diplomat. While the U.S. ambassador to the court of St. James, Bancroft assured Swain that he had spared no pains in searching the British State Papers Office for information relating to North Carolina history. Questions regarding English history background were among those Swain posed to Bancroft. Theirs was a long and productive correspondence and relationship. <clears throat> the picture here is of the UNC campus around 1861, the eve of the Civil War. <clears throat> At the university's June 1859 commencement, a visiting committee formed by the trustees found the university apparently in the high state of prosperity. It had the largest enrollment of any college or university in the United States, except Yale. The trustees had constructed, contracted for construction of two large new buildings, New East and New West. The university, the visiting committee concluded, has scarcely a superior and very few equals in the whole United States. Good times for the university meant good times for David Swain. These halcyon days would soon fall under the heavy shadow of the impending Civil War. Powerful forces and events beyond the control of Swain and his university were rapidly converging to the considerable detriment of both. Neither the Swain presidency nor the man himself would long survive this trauma. As Southern discomfort escalated, North Carolina participated in two last ditch attempts to avoid war. The General Assembly appointed commissioners to a peace conference <clears throat> held in Washington on February 4, 1861. It also appointed Swain and two of his former students as commissioners to the Montgomery, Alabama session at which the Confederacy was formally established. Commissioners to observe, <coughs> not delegates, because 
North Carolina was still a part of the Federal Union. Both missions failed to prevent the sectional breach, but as Swain noted after the war, the failure was not owing to any want of zeal or fidelity on the part of the commissioners, neither at Washington or Montgomery. Swain managed to keep the university open and functioning throughout the war, but the war devastated the institution. At its end, those who would have been its students were in battlefield graves or recovering from war wounds. The able-bodied among them were busy reviving neglected family farms. A tuition-driven university could not sustain the resulting financial losses. Zebulon Vance, pictured here, was Swain's student at Chapel Hill and the state's governor during the Civil War. Swain had known Vance's family from his childhood. Indeed, Vance's mother was an early Swain schoolmate and beau. Vance's uncle, Robert Vance, killed in a duel, duel had been among Swain's closest friends. Swain would become, in essence, a, young, a second father to the young governor. <laughs> <laughs> In early 1865, Swain perceived that the Civil War was ending. He suggested to another former governor, William A. Graham, that they recommend to Governor Vance that he designate them as commissioners to negotiate with Union General William Sherman to attempt to save the Capitol and other buildings in Raleigh and those at the University in Chapel Hill from Sherman's war ending path of destruction. It was done and the mission was successful. Historical perspective suggests that gratitude should have come to Swain in the wake of this success, but bitter enders unwilling to give up on the cause <coughs> accused Swain and Graham of fraternizing with the enemy. Some that thought they should have been hanged, not just in effigy, but literally. This rancor toward Swain, and because of him toward his university, was a mere beginning. In the depths of his imagination, Swain could not have imagined or prepared for occurrences that would soon aggravate this extant ill will. The train that had transported Swain and Graham to their negotiation with Sherman had encountered Union cavalry under the command of Brigadier General Smith D. Atkins of Illinois. He now found himself in command of the Union troops occupying Chapel Hill. When Atkins paid a courtesy call on the president of the town's university, it would evolve into something well beyond a routine encounter. Swain had one of General Cornwallis's order books, and when he requested it to show to his visitor, the bearer was his attractive 22-year-old daughter, Eleanor or Evan. Sparks flew instantly between the delivery girl and the waiting general. A mere four months later, the couple married at the Swain home in Chapel Hill. Overt hostility to the union did not lie dormant during the nuptial proceedings. Throughout the ceremony, UNC students raucously told the South Building Bell in protest. They also hung Swain and Atkins in effigy from the building's bell tower. The abiding damage to Ellis' beleaguered father was incalculable. The combined effect 
of Swain's war-ending role and Ellie's impolitic marriage was a considerable diminution <clears throat> in his popularity at the local and state levels. This curtailed his extensive participation in public life, little if any. Instead, his involvement at the national level increased significantly. In the immediate aftermath of the war, President Johnson and Secretary of War Stanton appointed Swain to the Board of Visitors of the U.S. Military Academy. This was but a small piece of Swain's post-war national level involvement. President Washington had summoned, President Johnson had summoned him to Washington to consult on reconstruction policy generally. For the rest of his life, Swain made periodic visits to and had extensive dealings with the national capital of the now reunited nation. In addition to consulting with President Johnson, Swain was busy securing pardons for himself and others who had, though reluctantly, supported the secessionist cause. Swain's near boundless business with large scale public affairs offered no respite from the university's problems. Like a feisty bulldog, they clung to him tenaciously, constantly nipping at his well-traveled heels. The university was actively advertising for students. Securing operating expenses became a constant struggle. Violent and conflicting political winds caught both Swain and his university in the war's aftermath. Prejudice against the university and its leader came from all sides and was steadily growing. The university's endowment was lost. It was totally dependent on fees for tuition. Admissions at Trinity and Wake Forest colleges were said to have exceeded those at UNC and the Virginia institutions too were attracting large numbers of North Carolina students. In these adverse circumstances, critiques of the university's president mounted. Long neglected problems surfaced and acquired strong legs. A dominant and demanding mood favored extensive reorganization and reform. <clears throat> The president was both old and old school and thus unlikely to catch a tidal wave of change and ride it successfully. A more probable change agent thus emerged. Kemp Battle, then age 35 and a four-year member of the UNC Board of Trustees became the leader of the reform forces. Swain became an object of pity, pity. Ultimately, the newly reconstructed, reconstituted Reconstruction trustees accepted the resignations of Swain and the entire faculty. His loss of prestige, power, and position can be attributed to no single cause. Political, institutional, and personal forces conspired against him. Arguably, without them, his UNC presidency would have ended only of his own volition or upon the ultimate involutional reality of death. <clears throat> when the end came, he attempted a cheerful countenance, but his effort to project a blithe spirit failed. The summer of his removal, 1868, found him melicopy, collie, drooping, and for the first time, showing his age. He would not long survive the loss of the office. On August 11, 1868, he was returning to Chapel Hill from a plantation he owned in Chatham County. 
a buggy drawn by a horse General Sherman had given Swain, which Swain had accepted as a symbol of reconciliation, hit a stump, injecting both Swain and his companion, Professor Manuel Fetter. Swain's injuries were sufficiently serious that he had to be carried on a stretcher from the accident scene across the UNC campus to his home. His faithful former, quote, servant, enslaved person, Wilson Swain, now Wilson Swain Caldwell, assisted with the homeward conveyance of his old master. 16 days later, on August 27, 1868, Swain's earthly excursion ended. His last conversations were about his favorite subjects, the history of North Carolina and the State University, which he loved better than his life. There have been numerous memorials to Swain. A county was named for him three years after his death. There is a Swain Hall on the UNC campus completed in 19. 14, and many others. <clears throat> Posthumous assessments of Swain's life and work also followed, too numerous to detail here. I close with just one paragraph of my own. Although David Lowry Swain's large share of life narrowed somewhat toward its end, even then he remained <clears throat> as since his youth, a vital and vibrant presence in his community, state, and nation. Arguably, he was the most influential and consequential North Carolinian of the 19th century. Indisputably, his name must appear prominently on any respectable shortlist from which that selection is made. I support that conclusion with an inventory of his many accomplishments as civic, political, and academic leader, historian, and historic preservationist, enhanced by his influence on hundreds of his boys and through them on many others. His claim to a place of durable influence and consequence comes not just from his own considerable accomplishments, but also from the achievements of the many whom he prepared for and stimulated to significant contributions to their communities, state, and nation. My readers and listeners may reach a different conclusion. Indeed, are invited to make their own assessments. If there is a better candidate for this designation, however, I would like to be educated <clears throat> about that person. <clears throat> Lauren, we'll turn it back to you for questions. Okay, great. Um, so it's a little bit past seven, so we can take questions um, for a few minutes. So if you have any questions, please submit them through the chat. Um, I will read them out loud for the group and then Judge Richard will answer them. So feel free to submit any questions at this time. <clears throat> okay, so we got one question asking, do we know where Swain is buried? Yes, he was, he was initially buried in the yard of the president's home in Chapel Hill, where he had a son and a daughter buried. A little over a year after his death, Eleanor Swain, who was very embittered by the treatment Swain had received from Governor Holden and the new trustees, moved all of them to Oakwood Cemetery in Raleigh, where they rest today with a very nice Scottish obelisk. 
I actually had a slide showing that, but for some reason my slideshow stopped with the Civil War slides, but he's buried in Raleigh's Oakwood Cemetery, one of, I think it's six North Carolina governors who are buried there. You would like judge I could try to share that picture from my end if you would if you wanted to. <laughs> You're welcome to do that. Okay. I was afraid to stop to try to. That's okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, Swain Hall um, shows you where the county is in the western part of the state and the historical marker to him. <clears throat> Any other questions? We got a comment thanking you um, for an excellent presentation. You are a true scholar. So thank you for that positive feedback. Uh, we did get a couple more questions just now. Um, have we had public education in some form in North Carolina since Governor Swain initiated it? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> he actually did not get to start it during his time as governor but he was building what was called the Literary Fund, which had been established when he was in the legislature toward the time when they could do it. And in 1840, the state opened the first, what was then called common school, now called public schools in Rockingham County. And when the state got ready to do this, it asked Swain to draw the plan. So even though he was at the university then, he, he drafted the initial plan for public education. The state was regularly developing its public education program. Uh, Cal, um, one of Swain's former students was the first superintendent of public instruction. The Civil War set all that back considerably and the state had to begin to rebuild its system going on up to Governor Aycock in the early 1900s, picked up with Governor Sanford and Hunt in our time. But yes, he never, he, as governor, he did not get a system started but when the state got to where it could afford it, he, he drew the plan. I saw something else. I saw something from Beth. I'll, right. just, I'll just read them aloud so that everyone can uh, yeah. follow. Um, so the next question is, do we know if there are any connections with the Lowry name and the Lowry family in Robeson County? I think the answer is no. That is a Lumbee name. Um, David Lowry, um, Caroline's first husband, was from the western part of the state. I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Okay. Um, another question. Do you know if the biography of Albert Coates also covered Alice Coates extensively? She was quite influential in her own right, but deferred to her husband, Albert, in terms of honors and recognition. The answer is it's a biography of Albert, but yes, you couldn't write about Albert <laughs> without writing about Gladys. She was his partner in getting the Institute going, keeping it going with their money during the depression. And it was very much their joint decision to leave their estates at the death of the last survivor to the university to be used for this, these purposes. The biography is by Howard Covington, a journalist based in Greensboro. 
and the title is The Good Government Man. Okay, um, we got another question asking if Swain himself did um, own enslaved people. Yes, he did. In a presentation like this, you've got to leave something out. There's an entire section of the book on Swain's personal life that I completely left out because of time limitations. But chapter 22 is entirely on him as a slave owner. There are references throughout the book um, to it, but one, one chapter details it extensively. He was said to be a much too indulgent slave owner. Everyone said he spoilt, S-P-O-I-L-T, both his slaves and his children, but he was, as were most of the substantial people in his time, a slave owner. So chapter 22, if you buy the book. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we do have one more question. Did Governor Swain's emphasis on infrastructure help the entire state to develop from coast to coast to bring parity to those parts of the state outside of Eastern North Carolina? Yes, indeed the Buncombe Turnpike, as I said, which he got done in his legislative days was very key to Western development, but yes, um, he was very much involved in building roads, canals, bridges. Later, during his years at the university, uh, as we stated, in cooperation with Governor Moorhead, the railroads, and yes, it, it, it benefited the whole state. <clears throat> okay, that's all the questions we've gotten so far. I'll leave the chat open, we'll give it another minute, see if any other questions come through. Uh, Let me quickly, if I could, Lauren, tell Beth the story about my last visit with Albert before he died. <clears throat> he had had the stroke that took him out a few months later, had had dinner and was up doing okay, struggling a little bit to talk because of the stroke. But just making conversation, I asked him how long he and Gladys had been married. And <clears throat> Gladys answered saying, if we can make it till June, it'll be 60 years. And I said something like, well, Albert, I sure hope Gladys will stick it out with you till June. So you can have that 60th anniversary. And in his inimitable way, struggling to speak a bit because of the stroke, he said, "Ah, oh God, I'm the one that's been thinking about getting up and walking out. <laughs> and if there were, there were no marriages made in heaven, but if there ever was one, it was theirs. But he had that self-deprecating sense of humor right to the end. Great. Well, yeah, we've got a couple of thank yous for um, a wonderful presentation. Um, so I think uh, we will conclude here. Um, if anyone has any follow up questions after the program, you can feel free to contact me here at the library. I will drop my email in the chat uh, right now. Um, and again, I'm in the North Carolina collection. Uh, we're open six days a week at Maine Library. Um, okay, how do we acquire the book? There, there is a copy in the North Carolina collection. We're getting some circulating copies for the, the rest of the library. But where would people purchase this book? You can, if you'll go to the, it, it's a UNC library publication but done through UNC Press. If you'll go to the press website, either put in my name or the title, A Consequential Life, it will tell you how to order the book. And if any of you have my email address or you can email Lauren and get it, I can send you a link to click on and do it. 
I did just find the link, so I will drop that in the ch in the chat there, the link to the UNC Press. So if you would like to read the book and learn more, um, you can purchase a copy. But again, we will have a couple of copies here at the library. Um, and we already have a copy um, in the North Carolina collection. Um, so yes, feel free to reach out to me with any follow-up questions. Um, but thank you again, Judge Wichard, for this very informative presentation on someone we probably didn't know much about before. Um, so we appreciate you bringing, bringing to light um, David Lowry Swain. And I thank the audience. I apologize for my voice. It's just a condition they say that I'm going to have the rest of my life, but it is aggravating. And I'm glad to see some familiar names on this. And I hope to see those of you whom I know sometime soon. <clears throat> Great. OK, thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Yep. <laughs>